Okay, here we go. Um, this garden is quite incredible. I hope some of you who haven't visited it yet can visit at some point. Um, but it also is, has come together in interesting way, and it really all starts in Bar Harbor, Maine. I had to pick a point. Uh, this is Bar Harbor, Maine in the 1880s, and this bit of land where the trees had not been clear cut, the settlement technique in those days was just to cut everything flat and then replant trees where you needed them. And some developers still do that. But um, this is the village as it developed. And this bit here is quite nice. Uh, and Beatrix Jones's parents bought a lot there and decided to build a summer house because this is such a chic part of the world. And many people are moving up from Newport to get closer to nature and less sort of formal socially. And as long as you had a chaperone along, you could do a lot of things. Um, Goodness. I better step away from that of the lightning. Um, this is Beatrix. Uh, she was born in 1872, and uh, this is the house being built. So she went up, she was born in New York, so her, her nature was Central Park. And Maine was her introduction to native plants. Uh, and they came up during the construction of this house to inspect even in the winter. And these are brand new little maples that had been planted in the warmer months. And anyway, this turned into a family home. She eventually um, received it as a gift from her mother. And this became Reef Point and Reef Point Gardens, which was her lifelong project up there. And it was located right here. Okay, this is the village again, Main Street, etc. And two doors down was this lot, okay, owned by a family named Sears from Boston. Mr. Sears was known as the largest taxpayer in Boston. I don't know if those figures hold out. But the house was called the Briars, and it will come back in this story. And the daughter, um, Sarah Choate, uh, actually, she became Mrs. Montgomery Sears later, was an artist and a good friend of John Singer Sargent, painter, quite accomplished, did this portrait of Beatrix when she was 18 or 20 years old, because they were neighbors in the summer in Bar Harbor. And a neighbor down here was George Vanderbilt and so forth, all along here, uh, some of those names that we know. Um, but her big break came in terms of really inventing a career for herself with this man, who was Charles Sprague Sargent. And this is a drawing of him by John Singer Sargent, uh, a cousin. And he was the first director of the Arnold Arboretum in Boston. Serious botanist, faculty member at Harvard, and, but uh, faced with the problem of laying out a synoptic collection of temperate plants um, in an accessible and hopefully beautiful way. And the Olmsted firm was engaged to do that. Uh, Mr. Sargent met Miss Jones, I think probably socially, uh, was taken with her brightness and uh, eager, sort of eager mind, and invited her to apprentice with him, essentially, at the Arnold Arboretum, and live with his family in Brookline, Massachusetts which she did for five years. And at that time, there were no academic programs in our landscape architecture at all, but none were open to women. And I, there were very few architectural programs, if not any, um, open to women at all. The first one I know of was in 1902, I think, when Marion Coffin uh, got a degree in architecture from MIT. And she had to bring a chaperone to her classes. So it was not an easy door to open. And, but Beatrix started ahead of that. So she was studying and getting her botany and a lot of other things with Professor Sargent. Um, and by watching the Olmsteads work at the Arboretum and going to their offices to see how they did things and all the young gentlemen were drafting and doing this and that and the other, she realized she needed drafting as a skill and surveying as a skill. And where was she gonna get those? Uh, and it just so happens that they had those classes at co the School of Mines in Co at Columbia. Of course, no women were admitted to any of those programs. Uh, 
So her family completely supported her in this somewhat exotic choice of uh, career. And uh, they engaged some of the teaching assistants from Columbia to privately teach Beatrix drafting and surveying. So she pieced together all these tools that she needed on her own uh, before an, an actual program in landscape architecture actually existed. The first one was in 1902 uh, at Harvard, founded by Olmsted and uh, President Elliott. So she's now studying with him. And she's about that age. She's about 20. Uh, and uh, very artistic, very sensitive, and very alert to things. Uh, and it didn't hurt to have Edith Wharton as, your, as her 10-year-older aunt, who was more like a big sister. So she got the full tour on all of the Italian villa trips and research and whatever. Did a lot of traveling. So she set up a practice in 1895 in New York in her mother's um, townhouse uh, in New York, uh, sort of in the attic, and started to take private clients, mostly for garden design. And this was published in a New York paper, um, I think about uh, 1897. And it's, I call it her mandala, uh, because it's Beatrix in the center, Miss Beatrix Jones. And then these are all pieces of her work. Um, and of course, it wasn't in color. Couldn't get very much out of that. But I do recognize this is a white spruce on the main coast. And this is a granite bench from Reef Point. So she was counting some of her own family work in her portfolio, which is fine. But she was getting press uh, for the, taking this career, which was very uh, sort of radical. Then, born two years later than Beatrix in 1874 is John D. Rockefeller, Jr who was here in the Mandolin Orchestra at Brown. Uh, so uh, he liked Brown. He went there. He was very shy, um, wasn't very social, but eventually met Senator Aldrich's daughter, Abby. Um, and uh, they had sort of a long courtship, eight or eight years, I think, at least. And then they became a couple officially in 1901, which was one of the great sort of artistic partnerships uh, in, on many levels formed at the early part of the century. And these two people uh, did amazing things in their lifetimes, but um, were a very good fit with Beatrix in terms of uh, interests and overlaps in culture. In 1905, John D. Jr supervised the building of Kaikat as his parents' home, but it also is his home. They had built a house there they were not so happy with. And this is a, quite a project for any of you who've been up to Kaikat. It's a piece of real estate. And um, I can't get near the computer. Oh, one more. Sorry about that. Um, main house here. Uh, Formal gardens here by Wells Bos Bosworth, who designed MIT. Uh, carriage house, playhouse, and then there are were greenhouses and things down at this end, and an orangery. So, um, and it's always been a puzzle to me how Mr. and Mrs. Rockefeller had met Beatrix Jones and how they came to work with her. And I always thought it probably was from much later, some other kind of exposure. She worked for the Rockefeller Institute in the teens, but um, recently discovered that she actually designed a garden at Kaikit in 1906. And it was the cutting garden that went with the, the uh, palm house and the greenhouses. And it consisted of a series of terraces that sort of uh, telescope like this and a high retaining wall on one side. Uh, and then the palm house and greenhouses were down here. And um, somebody had mentioned that years ago to me. And I said, well, what about that? And they said, oh, it was never built. Well, it was built and uh, existed for a while. And when the palm houses came down, uh, sort of in more recent years, this all went with it. But there's the palm house. Here's the oval at the top of the design. There's uh, another view. 
And then here's the Palm House again. So it was well known. It was part of a, a collection of uh, famous estate um, details from that period that the American public was very interested in. So um, this is the Briars, another view of it. The neighbor two doors down in Bar Harbor. Okay. In 1908, Abby and John rent this house for the summer, primarily because her obstetrician goes to Maine for the summer, and she was due in the summer. And um, so they rented this house. Nelson Rockefeller was born in this house, and he became a Maine citizen. I think he's the only member of the family that can boast of that. So, but that's where the real contact comes um, with Mount Desert Island. John D. had come with, to visit some of his brown school chums when he was a student, and so he got a sense of Bar Harbor, but didn't really know it. So uh, the next year, by the way, uh, 1909, that house, the Briars, was sold to a family called McLean, or given to McLean by uh, Mrs. McLean's father as a wedding gift. And then the McLeans went on to buy the Hope Diamond and they had it exercised to get rid of the curse, but I'm not sure that worked very well. Uh, so these little threads are quite interesting in how many things overlap. So they, um, this thing wants to back up on me. It's like a horse and buggy. The, um, so they started looking not in Bar Harbor, where it was very social and very crowded, but in Seal Harbor. And they found a piece of land uh, they liked, that already had a house on it. Of course, it wasn't quite this house. It was a part of this house. And they bought it and then enlarged it a lot more using the New York architect Duncan Candler. And uh, they grew it up to a little over 100 rooms to be a little more comfortable. And it was called the Irie. Uh, and uh, this is the entry drive, which is all planted in native plants. Uh, and there was some evidence that Beatrix worked on that, but I can't find the documentation anymore. I'll find it again. And this looked out over the ocean. It wasn't on the shore. Then views were more important than the clean air and not being near all that smelly sea stuff. So, um, but beautiful uh, with Acadia National Park uh, eventually behind it. It wasn't a park yet. Uh, it wasn't made a park until I think 1919. It was a national monument for a while and so forth. And Mr. Rockefeller became very interested in that and helped greatly uh, on that uh, particular national park, which is, I think, the only one in the country that's made up of gifts of land. The government didn't buy it or conserve parts um, and then turn it into a park. So this is the entire brood, as big as it got, um, standing in front of the Irie, which was their summer home and sort of sole base in Maine, and uh, where everybody loved it and grew up there. And this is Lawrence, uh, Babs, the oldest daughter, uh, Winthrop, David, uh, John the, oh, sorry, that's John the third, and uh, David and Abby and Winthrop and Papa and Nelson. So that's a lot to handle. Maine's a good place for activities. So um, in 1921, one of Mr. Rockefeller's many activities um, really bore fruit. And the Peking Union Medical Union, which was the first Western-style medical school in Asia, uh, was opened and dedicated in Beijing and Peking. So they went for the dedication, and that's what catalyzed this amazing trip that put Asia at their feet and much more profound understanding of the art and the culture and actually where a lot of their collected art had come from. So there were pieces of a puzzle that clicked in their minds. This is the dedication ceremony with all the students and faculty and everybody standing. It was done in a sort of modern Chinese architecture, and then there was a lunch Later the day, uh, there's John D., there's Abby, and the daughter, Babs, was along on that trip. Um, and, and so they got a lot of exposure to Chinese architecture then. 
and how uh, the Chinese live. There was a, pr a prince whose palace they spent quite a bit of time in. I don't think that exists anymore. This exists now as the Capitol Hospital in Beijing, if any of you know Beijing. It's still going, and it was really a critical uh, sort of keystone um, in that culture and in modern science there. Now, as the regular tourist thing, they were exposed to the Forbidden City, got to see it. However, it didn't look like that, which is modern. It looked like this. The last emperor was just barely hanging on um, and was sort of under house arrest, and nothing was being maintained. And this is not sustainable, as they would say now. Um, and so everything was growing up in weeds. This is all paved, and the weeds were coming right up in the cracks between the pavement. And things were kind of falling apart. Uh, but they also saw architectural details that they imprinted on that we'll see again in this main garden. This is a roof ridge detail. These are the, the yellow or the gold tiles, by the way, are only for imperial use. And the rose pink color, which is paler than this, this has been uh, tarted up a bit, I think, on the photograph. But anyway, the, uh, is also for imperial use. So these, these were sort of iconic materials and colors that they saw very prominently in China. And that registered. Now, the Forbidden City, in a quick thing, is a, is a rectangle on a pure north-south axis. And there's nesting involved, which is sort of a commu uh, Confucian hierarchy. And the central part, the most forbidden part, is the central axis. And then there are secondary um, officials and relatives and what are off on the sides. So this is the entry axis. And this little space at the back, the hardest one to get to, the most private, is the emperor's garden. Um, and in this garden, which is highly formalized, this is a palace. It's not, it's not um, a pleasure garden in that sense. It's more of a state garden, um, but it was his pleasure. And it had a lot of elements, water. It had rockeries and so forth. But I want to draw your attention to the symmetry of the architecture. But these green planters all have twin cypress trees in them, trees planted with two trunks, sometimes right up against each other, sometimes wide enough to see through, which is a, not a Western thing. It's there on the axis with gates, on axis with um, openings and so forth, which is just sort of jarring uh, to a Western sensibility. And um, those sank in. Here they are again. Up and down, you can see there's a pair there, and there, and there, and there. And this pair is outside this pavilion, which is this pavilion. So uh, it seems odd to us. This pair is quite wonderful. They're here. And actually, the trees have grown together, and they're called the hugging trees. They're still alive. They're still in that palace. And now you can't get photographs of them because they're absolutely swarming with tourists taking selfies in the arch, lots of couples. And, um, and, and so this winter shot was the only one I could find uh, without too many people. Then things like traditional um, geometric gates. Here's a moon gate with a tile roof. And this actually is, has a garden forecourt, because you can see a taihu stone sticking up in the rear. But everything's sort of run down. You can see exposed brick with the plaster. Here's another simpler one. And then with, uh, with um, couplets in tablets on both sides of the thing that would usually have some sort of poetic title for the portal or the space on the other side. And then this one is not, this is called, uh, in China it's called a vase gate. And we call it a bottle gate. Um, and there are several shapes, but they're basically uh, a silhouette of them. You can walk through, but there's a neck on them. And that idea came home. Then a very powerful landscape for the Ming tombs, which in the old days didn't have a tree anywhere in sight. And it had first, the first guardians were big life-size or larger animals carved in granite at two by two. And then uh, it went to uh, soldiers as guardians, like temple guardians, and then um, gentlemen scholars or officials who were the intellectuals supposedly in the in the uh, holding together of this society. 
And this is, of course, a more modern thing. They've planted the whole thing as an alley of weeping willows um, now for the tourists. And there are ornamental gates, and then there's a mound at the end that's part of the tomb. Um, when, uh, as an aside, when John and Abby got back, he uh, donated money for the uh, restoration and conservation of the Ming tombs. That was one of his first projects. He was, anytime he saw something that he thought could use a little help, he did. The, I include this uh, period uh, lithograph card of the Temple of Heaven, not because of the lovely color scheme, which is exaggerated, but because of the walls, which I think are notable. These are the only curved walls you really see in older architecture. This, since the emperor was the communicator with heaven, or uh, he was the only one that entered this sacred space. Round, round means heaven, square means earth. So um, uh, a round building, a round sort of pagoda-like building is a direct connection. And as is the cobalt blue tile, which could only be used in these temples, not in any sort of private um, uh, residential work. So this was here. And it's all very orderly and quite symmetrical, and it's on its axis. But this wall is curved and it's lovely. And there are places where you can stand in it, and you can say something, and somebody standing way down here can hear it, like you're right next to them because of the acoustics following the wall. So it's a it's a amusement to tourists. But this is the only place they could have seen a curved wall as a compound, as an enclosure. Now. Um, Beatrix had designed a Chinese garden right near here in Westbury, New York <laughs> for Willard Strait um, just a few years earlier, four or five years earlier. And it had pavilions and sort of lattice work, sort of chinoiserie pavilions, um, walled, brick walled um, gardens, and then a great grass alley and fountains up through the center. And the patterns in here were geometric, and they were all planted out in bedding plants. And there really wasn't anything Chinese about, about it, but it had this sort of decorative flavor. Uh, so that was, and she'd never been to the Far East. Um, she spent most of her time traveling in Europe, and I think most of her reading uh, was for European traditions, too. Um, the only thing in this, in this uh, Abby Oliver's Rockefeller Garden that I see that resonates with something she had seen in her European travels is the sunken garden at Hampton Court uh, with a series of walls and sunken panels and, of course, a much more geometric approach to bedding. It doesn't really flow, as we would say today, uh, but it also changed over the years in interpretation. Now. Um, on the piece of land, when they got back from, when they got back from Asia, because they went to Japan and China primarily, but also some time in Korea and a couple of other stops, it was like three months, and they came back just exploding with ideas. And they decided that the Irie needed a garden. And they had all these ideas. So um, this is the house that you saw from a lower angle in the other photograph. This is actually after the garden was built. So it couldn't be seen from the house. It wasn't an ornament to the house. Uh, it was a destination, which was also very unusual uh, for the day. And these are ledges um, and looking out to sea. So there's no view out to sea there. You can see some mountains from inside the garden. But they chose that spot. And then in 1926, they decided they were going to do the garden. And they engaged Mrs. Um, Farron. She was Mrs. Farron by that time uh, to come. And they uh, tromped all over the lot, and they found a uh, sort of flattish place, but it was low, because this was on the side ridge of one of those mountains. And they plotted this out. Um, this is a, a north-south axis. And oh, it's upside down. This is a north-south axis. And that's a key tree, a pair of trees they came across in the woods. This is all wooded. And it took everything else away. And they, they uh, drew a line straight south. And then they put a stake in the ground at that end. And it's where, OK, here's the trees. That's where the pool was placed. So they were the two ends of this axis. 
And when it was conceived, this is the first drawing done sort of scritchy style uh, on paper, probably in the field. Um, and you can see things have been moved and crossed out. There's the spirit path right here, which was what Mrs. Rockefeller considered to be her, her Chinese garden. She talked about a Chinese garden. It's not what the Chinese would think of the garden. It's really funerary architecture, very strong uh, alley of sculptural elements, very powerful. Um, but in, the, in this environment, very beautiful. Um, and then the idea for a flower garden was sort of more practical. It wasn't a pleasure garden, it was a cutting garden for the house. So that got refined to this. And here we can go again with the two trees, uh, which I'm sure no one has really been able to figure out since. And uh, the reflecting pool down to south the spirit path, which even goes further later, it was added to, and um, then this is a flower garden, and all screened off and separated by hedges, uh, loose hedges of cedar and so forth, or just carved out of the woods. This is a double planter wall, about four feet high, that was then planted with Rogoza Rose to make a hedge that was high enough so that when you walked down this, you wouldn't see all of that and like a hummingbird just make a dart for the flower garden which is what people tend to do visually uh, there so those were some of the basic ideas how it was laid out the whole um, idea of north south axis and um, and this road um, this road uh, was a work road that was there and they kept working with that even though some things didn't line up and eventually were changed. And there was an idea for having a gate of some sort, a moon gate or something, and they talked about extending this wall as a higher wall and having an opening through there, but that never quite resolved. And so they started clearing and they cleared all winter, cleared trees and they cleared stones. These are stones <laughs> that have been piled up by hand. And they started building walls in the snow. I mean, this was on track and um, uh, no power equipment of any sort, just sheer determination of brute force. Here, more stones being moved by hand and clustered and then they were hauled away or used. This is a team planting trees bare root in the middle of the winter. Well, not bare root, but in a frozen root ball. They would be taken up over the new wall, the short wall, on a ramp, and then down in. So the trees all along the spirit path are native trees, but they weren't all there originally. They were amended uh, with native trees probably dug on the property. The one major horticulturist who was involved was this man, uh, Charles Miller, who owned a local nursery and was bright and energetic, and um, he really seems to have supervised the construction and the planting of this garden, and he probably sold quite a few plants, too. Eventually, they convinced him to become the first head gardener. Um, and it's in his um, belongings that his widow, who had remarried, still had that I found the scrapbooks with these pictures. The Rockefeller family doesn't have these. The archives don't have them and they were dated. He was a wonderfully compulsive man. So that a lot of these things that were never dated in any kind of correspondence or on a plan now can be put into a time frame. So whenever you see one of these in the talk, that's a, that's a piece of the puzzle uh, down that way. And I copied these from this woman. She remarried. She, I think, died. The house, the kids got the house. Everything was cleaned out, and it's gone and I copied the originals in the house. So that's a, that's a digging technique that really pays off because you never know where some of these things are gonna go, uh, the landfill or something when they, and they're valuable. So here are the walls being built for the so-called cutting garden. And then here's the pool sort of mocked up. It's just sort of a, I don't know if it had a liner or what. It wasn't the real pool, but that's the location. And you could see how it would bring light into this end of the garden and reflect the two main spruces that were, and then at that point, you could see a little bit of mountain at one end and then later out this end, 
So, um, and the, the cutting garden was set up, I mean, how do you set a flower list for a garden? Well, normally, it's an ornamental garden. You start listing your favorite things and what seasons they bloom in and so forth. This was listed by number of rooms in the house, color combinations in those rooms, number of vases in each room, and uh, filling them or refilling them at least once a week, and um, which flowers would work best, and doing all the multiplication until you got this plant list that was basically a floral plant list. And that was the underpinning list for this, and then it was filled out with more for the uh, garden. Here ideas, so the, there were no walls per se, none of the big walls, none of the gates existed, but they were playing with ideas, and here are some of her early sketches, and here's one with a, something in between and a gate on each side, that didn't work, you know, this is sort of like um, Goldilocks, and this one was a little too chinoise and didn't quite work, and then this worked, although it has a few little modifications, but quite simple and plain, which they did see in China. So it's authentic, but it's not grand. I'll try. Um, spirit path, spirit way, as the, as the sort of Chinese LA was called, uh, was happening in parallel. Here are trees still being cut and rough ground and these figures are being set. So again, it's hurry, 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 everything going in, sort of layers of people working at the same time. The thing that, uh, by the way, it's a complete myth that they brought these home in their luggage from that trip. <laughs> I know there probably weren't weight limits in those days because you were on a ship, but they saw these things, they saw these in Korea, which are copies of the Chinese ones, quite good copies. It's a, it's a tradition that really spun off from China. And um, they acquired them through a Japanese dealer in antiquities, uh, who after a couple of sales set up an, a, a shop in Bar Harbor, Maine, <laughs> along with a shop in Kyoto, um, Tokyo, Paris, and London, and maybe New York, I forget. There might have been a New York thing, but Bar Harbor, Maine was the end of their uh, stretch. Um, the, uh, and this is what it turned out to be. So it's a long processional with a steely at the end. At the upper end, the south end, there's a gate being proposed. And again, this one is sort of curly cued and fancier. All of that was done in full-scale mock-up cutouts to test it in the space, both in terms of its location, fore and aft, as well as its scale. And so here we are with the gate looking from where the figures are. And then here is a granite sheep. And there's another one under this box. And in the, in the um, Ming tomb, and actually the Qing tomb uh, ceremonial ways, um, the animals are all facing the pathway. And these didn't wind up facing the path. The sheep, the two sheep took a different tack, but everybody else is facing the pathway. So this, this proves that this is one of the ideas that was considered and, and experimented with. But all of these full-scale mock-ups to make absolutely sure it fit uh, are quite incredible, I think. This is what the final gate looks like. It's done in masonry, brick masonry. Oops back there um, with the yellow tile roof. And the tiles became available when part of the Forbidden City that was crumbling was being salvaged. So um, uh, somebody scooped those up, and I think they might have come through Yamanaka, too. They had enough to do two buildings and part of a wall, and then they got more. And then, as I said, years later, they were able to get more than the original figures they had for here and enlarge that. But it's quite, all this is native planting. Moss, lowbush, blueberry, juniper, and so forth. And it's very serene to walk down there. And this was Mrs. Um, Rockefeller's favorite way of bringing guests to the garden, is to come here, go down the spirit way all the way to the end, pass the flowers, bring them back, and then go into the flower garden and let them loose. Uh, and uh, 
uh, a bottle gate or a vase gate was put in at the side, a sort of a diversion. And so when she came back to the north end of the, of the, uh, or as you say, the south end of the Spirit Way, this was how she'd usually take them into the garden. And then it would all be a surprise that unfolded again. Now here are the, here is the figures. Uh, this is the soldier guy, and this is chain mail carved in, on his shoulders in granite. And these are the scholar officials who were um, gentlemen scholars, sort of, and uh, they were part of the civil service system. The first civil service system in the world was this one developed in China, which had exams. It, uh, and theoretically, anyone could rise to an important position, except one really needed the education to know what the exam was about. So that uh, uh, young men who uh, studied in temples and so forth and were tutored sometimes had enough of an advantage to go up the ladder. Um, much like the SATs. Uh, along that path halfway, there's this wonderful ledge uh, with what looks like a Parker roll made out of granite uh, here. And this is built. It's a pool, but it's built into the ledge. And then there's a beautiful granite lantern here, which is actually Korean. It's all in one piece, uh, instead of being all these individual pieces that stack and a little uh, uh, seat there. It's a lovely little place to meditate. And you can look over the, over the hedge wall into the flower garden from there. And at the other end is the stele, uh, which is the destination. There's no tomb. There are no human remains uh, on this one. You get there, and there's a lovely view off to the side that's the surprise. But on the back side of the stele, if you look carefully, there is a twin cypress. And there's two gentlemen flanking. And there's, a, there's some sort of a story about twin monks who are very significant in time who um, were famous for uh, living with or at or something, a twin uh, park. So this is part of that twin tree uh, tradition that ties all the way back to China. Uh, here's the mock-up for the gate at the end of the flower garden. Here's what it looked like from down at the pool. And so here they're experimenting with height, they're experimenting with the spacing, and this would be in the, in the Forbidden City, um, a fairly high-ranking set of gateways, because the center one's always for the emperor, and then there's two for slightly lessers, and then there's two more for lower hierarchy and so forth. So uh, to only have three means it's a fairly uh, classy gate system. Um, now here's the first plant, oops, planting plan which concentrated on the outside borders because they were mostly perennials, uh, the very initial one. Then they, this is the center. It's lawn now. This was solidly planted with what were called annuals, which included non-hardy bulbs, glads, um, dahlias, all that sort of thing. So this had to be, this is 120 feet long. <laughs> and it had to be completely replanted from scratch every year. And you couldn't even see into the middle of it. These were little um, service paths, which are just stepping stones and, and trodden paths, um, because you were supposed to be cutting out of this. Well, the cutting part didn't really work out. It doesn't often work out, uh, where you're trying to have a beautiful garden and cut, because well, it's one of the other winds. But this is what it looked like when the whole center was planted with flowers and just paths going straight up through. There's the moon gate at the end, and path, path, and then there was a cross path. Here's what it looked like at the north end uh, with the two spruces, that one and that one. This one went down in a storm, I think, in the 50s. So there's only the lone one left, and it's hanging on by a toenail. Um, and the two side gates and the moon gate. So this is the lovely terminus of the garden and where the different color theories meet because this is permanent planning, not cutting. And now it's all, it's all a pleasure garden. Um, this is the side border, the west border, which is um, the cool side. Um, 
Ferrand used a lot of Jekyll ideas and techniques. Gertrude Jekyll was quite radical in the 19th century, but everybody thinks she's all hat now. Um, she was trained as a painter, so she applied color theory to planting theory, colors, how you mix colors and why, um, is, and, um, and the sort of chemistry of different colors next to each other visually. And um, uh, Farrand used a lot of those ideas her whole life. I think she bought every book that Jekyll published, which were many. Um, the first time the garden was sort of open for public viewing, and not really public viewing, but anyway, was in 1934 when the Garden Club of America had its annual meeting on Mount Desert Island. So this map was drawn up in Mrs. Farron's office to show what the garden was at that point. It was a snapshot, but it was thought to be basically complete then. And it was still all annual garden in the middle, this elliptical lawn, there's a little shade garden here with sculptures in it. Here's the spirit path with more additions and the steely at the end. And then the bulb house had been turned into uh, a more ornamental building with a tile roof. And here's the gate at this end. So this, this sort of arts and crafts graphic style is sort of fun. And uh, um, here's something that I think is very relevant. And when you look at the, um, if you go to see the show of Francis Johnston's um, images that were t hand tinted glass slides, this is an example of how hand tinted glass slides can be quite misleading historically in terms of color. These are two taken in 1934 on that trip. This one hand colored, I think probably weeks after it was taken when it was developed back in somebody's studio from memory um, and Frances, I think, did that somewhat too, but she knew her plants. She was a real plants woman and horticulturist, and so she knew what they were supposed to look like. This is not, you know, the blue grotto. And, um, and uh, it's a pink wall, you know. I mean, there's some basic things, regardless of what's in bloom at the time. So for me, there's a black and white series that isn't in the Smithsonian that were stereo cards made of the same images by that photographer that tell you, you can blow them up, they're high resolution, and they give you a lot more detail to look at. Um, so I'm always torn. This Everybody likes color. and um, But this, to me, says a lot more. And here are the two spruces. And you can see between them to the sh sort of shrine on axis at the other end of the garden. They frame it. Um, this is the uh, cool side border outside the garden. Uh, and these were all taken in um, the 1980s when I was working with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Rockefeller, late 80s. And um, Peggy Rockefeller and David took over this garden when Mr. Rockefeller Sr. died in 1960. And then, and Peggy was a very serious, serious student of horticulture and had a good eye and um, understood the concepts that this was built on and actually had used Mrs. Farrand to design their own garden in Seal Harbor, Maine. So they knew her personally and she was a friend for the rest of her life. So um, she took this over and continued to fine tune things, again trying to switch to more perennials and fewer annuals just for sort of a sustainability uh, component, which wasn't a popular term then. Then a uh, big change came um, in 1936 when a good part of the center was turned into lawn. Not all of it, <laughs> but a lot of it. So uh, this is the wall, and then there's more borders you know, on each side and around the top. So the cross paths came out, and just this much remained, and then a, a perimeter path went in with borders on both sides of the perimeter path. And this is what it looked like. Again, I think this is the only image of that. See, there's the path, border, border, lawn, and same over here, border, border, and then a wall, and then another double border on each of these sides. Still a lot of flowers. Um, but it gives it a breathing space, a sort of a foil in the center, which I think everybody liked and appreciated. And so it has evolved from there. 
um, and eventually the inner, this border was removed. So there's a path and then grass and then a path and then a border and it's compressed even more, which is the, the more or less the layout now. There it is now. Um, now there's been a hot, Jekyll dealt in hot colors and cool colors and believed that they did things um, as they do in painting to create um, perspective illusions and so forth and how you see something, whether it recedes or whether it comes forward and so forth. So she often used them in the same border. Farrand here uh, decided to make a warm side and a cool side, predominantly warm and predominantly cool. And uh, so this is from uh, that period. Here is the spruce, the remaining spruce, which was uh, guide every winter so it wouldn't go over in a storm. But other things you can see are growing up as high and sort of masking it. And that kind of um, editing and maintenance has been a problem uh, that's been, been dealt with, but it's been rather harsh uh, at this late date to go in and, and take out big trees and leave some, real, leave some really big gaps. So here's, again, the lawn with the warm side border. Uh, the interesting thing about Farron's bed designs is they don't look like bricks. Uh, this one looks a little bricky in the front, but they're more like a stone wall where every stone bridges a joint of the two below it. So you don't see straight up a seam anywhere and you don't see regular pieces of, of a plant mass. Uh, and so they flow together better. And as I said, this, this front row is a little blocky, but this flows pretty well. And you can, but you can see that in her plans if you look at them. This is the warm side uh, outside the wall. That's the wall. Uh, this is the cool side inside the lawn, inside the wall. There's the wall. Cool. And you can see how the massing there is a little more fluid. Uh, and that's cool side outside the wall. The fragrance in this garden is wonderful. There are a lot of lilies and things, and it's a walled garden. So it's like walking through a swimming pool of perfume. And uh, I was told by a Persian friend that that was a major component of um, Persian gardens and Islamic gardens because they were used in the evening. And you should be able, a good horticulturist should be able to be blindfolded and taken through a garden and identify what's blooming uh, by the mix not just a single aroma. So uh, this is, again, the, the mirror pool and the view from that end of the garden. This is more enclosed now, but see these trees have gotten huge and they're not all native. They discovered in editing that several of them are European lindens, which must have been tucked in for quick cover. Uh, and at the other end, at the south end, is this shrine. All of the sculptures and the sort of shrines are in native plantings and they're offset from the floral plantings. They're not used as finials and ornaments in the flower beds, which is a common uh, technique in Western gardens. And so it seems more respectful to me to handle them that way. There's a little side garden, that shade garden, and there's an incense burner that's quite wonderful in bronze that came from Beijing. And um, and when incense is burned in here, it comes out, and it may, these are supposed to be clouds, and it makes this sort of lion foo dog uh, look like he's in the clouds, but also smoke goes up his rear end and comes out his mouth. <laughs> so, uh, but it's hard to convince Mr. Rockefeller to fire this up because it's an antique. Uh, one thing in the garden that nobody seems to be no have noticed, it's not on the inventory anymore, or, or link, are there are two Taihu stones that obviously are not from Maine they're a totally different type of stone, that were brought in somebody's luggage uh, or pur purchased from Yamanaka. And they're tucked in with ferns and things in this garden. And of course, those vertical stones are a very direct allusion to the, the haystack sort of mountains in Chinese art in China in, China in general and um, speak in that way. Uh -huh. At the north axis, you have the moon gate, 
after you're past the spruces and in the shadows deep in, in a, an exedra of Acer Pennsylvanicum. Uh, uh, there's a wonderful bronze Buddha that's gilded, and this is a close-up of him. And there are actually two of these. There's one up on the side hill at the end of an even longer axis. These were both added in 1936. So, um, and they were really the last major pieces that went into that garden. So it was really considered sort of complete then. Uh, the war came along and threw a wrench into things. Um, uh, I mean, the footprint is basically the same, but the, the garden was basically closed down for the war years, as many people did. And everything in the flower beds was planted out in grass. And then after the war, they asked Mrs. Um, Farrand uh, to come back and help because there weren't any nurseries. All the, all the nurserymen had gone off to war and so forth, so there weren't many nurseries running and there weren't any plants to buy. So um, it was a real struggle the first couple of years to get this back up to speed, um, and, uh, but they managed. And I think that's it for now, in a nutshell. Um, that's how this garden, did the sound go off? No. That's how this garden came to be. Um, and it was such a wonderful collaboration because, which only comes out through piecing all these documents together, because Farron purged her correspondence and her notes from her papers before she gave everything to Berkeley. So you don't have all these little notes about who does what and whatever. Mr. Rockefeller was compulsive about correspondence because he was also working on Williamsburg, um, Versailles restoration, Rockefeller Center, a few little projects like that while this was being built in Maine. And everything had the same attention to detail. It's like each one was a single project for him. So he, he expressed most of Mrs. Rockefeller's wishes to Mrs. Farrand. He would answer correspondence typed on onion skin. Remember onion skin? Which scan, scans very well, by the way in the old days. And um, so those are all preserved. And he sort of restated questions and bits of information from her previous letter in his reply. So we don't have her letters, but we really have kind of both sides through his letters. And yet he didn't keep any drawings to speak of. And she kept everything, including things on trace that weren't built. Uh, all those little gate designs and things that were just scratched out. So those two, um, those two sets of, of documents, you know, really, really speak to the, the relevance of archives. And of course, personal archives in the terms of family scrapbooks, I vote for because those are priceless too in terms of missing pieces of the puzzle. Um, the garden carries on. Mrs. Rockefeller died in 1996. And that was really the end of my relationship and everybody's relationship with her. So our planning, they were planning for the future and talking about a uh, visitor center possibly. Um, we had published a, um, a guidebook that was a big success. And they realized that this is much bigger than a family garden, that it's an important work of art. It's an important American masterpiece. And it should be shared with the public, but not too much. It's still a private garden. And so they, they should have the right to enjoy it as much as they want. So uh, over time now, it will be gradually more accessible, although it does have a carrying capacity that was sort of brutally brought home with a rush of people one year after um, an article was published. And uh, the place was overrun, and they had to resod the lawn every week. And then they closed it for a year to uh, let it recoup and heal, and then uh, thought everything through and took a deep breath and started again. So it is possible to see it now. There are um, methods in place from, from uh, the work uh, I helped with for making a reservation in advance. So if you know you're going to drive all the way to Maine, you can see it, and for scholars and so forth. And then the first intern um, uh, was placed uh, in that period. And all of those things seem to have taken root and are helping the garden and helping people who really appreciate it have access. Are there any questions? Yeah. She worked on, was that called Rock? 
the question was, did, she, did Beatrix Farron work on Rockefeller Institute? She worked on something called, oh, you said university. She worked on something called Ro Rockefeller Institute, which I think became Rockefeller University. I'm not sure what she did, um, but the records are in Berkeley, if you wanted to check. Um, and she didn't work, I don't think, on any of his other projects. But as I said, she worked for David and Peggy on their private home. Um, and actually, a wonderful story about Beatrix and the Rockefellers and her favorite client. All of her best clients became friends because they worked together for so long and in a really sort of intimate way. So you get to know people really well. So when she decided to dissolve Reef Point for a number of reasons, um, and finances wasn't one of them. By the way, that's another myth. Um, she had what I called an invitational yard sale. And she sent invitations to her favorite friends. Uh, she had had everything that she couldn't keep any longer appraised and um, cataloged and so forth. And then they drew lots to come into the house, like for an estate, a real estate sale. And, um, and the Rockefellers got quite a high number. <laughs> so. Uh, they went in and they got to pick whatever they liked and Mr. Rockefeller is such a joy because there are things all over the house and he, you mentioned Mrs. Rock, Mrs. Farron and he'll say, oh yeah, those coffee tables there, which are bronze water measures, you know, that are antiques, were hers and we got them from her and we got those prints and we got this stuff and, and I know two or three other people like that that got things right, you know, from her warm hands, as my mother would say, and, um, and treasure them and live with them and it, and it evokes her every time somebody says something or uses something or whatever. But, and then she had a second one um, posthumously when she died for all of the things at Garland Farm. And that's where a couple of pieces of Cudwallader furniture made their way out and into the market and then 20 years later turned up at Christie's for a million and a quarter dollars. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. My question is, it has to do with the inspiration for the garden. And uh, my understanding is that in, in Japan, if you live in Shinto, you die Buddhist. So there's a spiritual element to the design of the garden. And I'm wondering if the Chinese influence, do we see a similar thing in that structure as far as we can? You see some, but this is not considered a Chinese garden. The question was, uh, is there any similarity in China to the Japanese custom of thinking there are spiritual components to the garden that are perhaps parallel to different stages of life or whatever? And if this were a real Chinese garden, I could say yes, but they didn't. This, this has a Chinese wall and some Chinese detailing the only part that's really conceptually solid in terms of that culture is the spirit way. Because there were no flower gardens in China, so you wouldn't have, uh, uh, you wouldn't put a Chinese frame on a Western picture, you know. And uh, that's the mistake people make. They see the detailing, whether it's Chinese wallpaper or something, and they try to set the whole thing under that sort of definition. And this escapes that, which makes it unique. It's really a wonderful hybrid. It's not a copy of an Italian garden, uh, literally or close to literally, that was so popular just before that in American garden design. Italian, it was the most popular foreign style to copy. And um, Japanese didn't take off until later. There was Japanese exposure at the World's Columbian Exposition and a couple of other places where there were proper, proper, um, authentic Japanese gardens built for the public to see within this fair 
thing. But for people who couldn't travel that far, which is arduous, um, they didn't really have much. The, the number of articles on Asian gardens, descriptive articles, which are usually one or two pages, they weren't in a lot of depth, started showing up in the late 1890s in American publications, where the whole consciousness that there was another world out there and it was a culture and it might be interesting happened. And then, uh, and of course, Italy and English gardens and French gardens were much further back. So the catching up on that wave uh, took a while, but this was this was sort of the best of both worlds, I think, and uh, uh, in terms of putting it all together, probably doesn't make sense to either culture, but it's a wonderful hybrid. Yes. We sort of do. Uh, the positive reason is that um, it was a brand new department. And Mr. Vaughn, Professor Vaughn, the chairman of the department, was sort of charismatic and bright and attractive and um, was a good development person, which most academics weren't. And now we know in institutions, there aren't many professors at the top. They're usually, they're usually very good people who can uh, raise money and, and develop things. And he convinced her, because she was going out in the winter um, to the West Coast because her husband was the first director of the Huntington Library. So they would spend the winters out there and then come back. And uh, she was wrestling with this idea even after she was um, widowed and knew him and must have confided in him and said that she wanted a place where the students would have access to it and it would use it and it would mean something, it would make a difference. And Berkeley met all those conditions, and she didn't think that Harvard would, which was un unwritten, that's my interpretation. Um, and history has borne out that fact and with a lot of other gifts I know about that have wound up on back shelves somewhere or deaccessioned. Yes? Not really, because the, the rectangle just doesn't have a, I mean, rect That's just, that's probably just a harmonic that agreed with her eye. The question was about the proportions and the cutting garden. Um, I said, you know, Jekyll had more to do with anything about how things were laid out and even the size of the masses, because it's like using a big daub of paint versus a little, a little daub of bright red, you know balance out. Uh, the cutting garden, when they decided that it just wasn't working, was moved to a site a mile away <laughs> where nothing would clash, and the greenhouses were moved there, and everything is still grown there. No cross paths. No, not Chinese. Very Western. English, French, Dutch, you name it, they all do it. The Chinese didn't. And they didn't grow flowers in that way. They, had, they grew flowers in a separate nursery that was out of sight and often in containers and would bring them out at perfection when the peony is going to open. And that would be an event. It wasn't massed. Now you go to a Chinese garden and you get masses of flowers and pots because visitors have said, this can't be a garden. There aren't any flowers here. And boy, the next day there are flowers there. You know, so... Um, it's a cultural difference, and it's a, a, a kind of a less is more thing, but a really qualitative uh, difference. But actually not handing, and they enforce the no cutting rule, you know, by pain of I don't know what now. Uh, nobody goes up there to cut out of that garden. They can go to the cutting garden. And actually all the secret delphiniums that come in in the night to replace the withering ones live in the cutting garden. So it's a lot like what Francesca does. <laughs> Here. Okay, I'm going to wind up. Um, thank you. While you file out, the two ladies in the garden at the beginning, the two white haired ladies that had founded the Wild Gardens of Acadia, one of them was on Beatrix Farron's board of directors. <laughs> 
And that's where I heard all about Beatrix. Nothing had been published on Beatrix then. It was before the Dumbarton Oaks Symposium and stuff. And the other one's husband was on that first faculty of the Peking Union Medical College and had lived in Beijing for 10 years, including when the Rockefellers went to visit and knew that part of the world. And so I learned all about the two ends of that spectrum from them. Thank you.